Our guest today is Steve Lindau. He's a professor of ecology of plant associated microorganisms at UC Berkeley. Steve's lab focuses on the life and ecology of epiphytic bacteria, bacteria pathogenic and non pathogenic that live on plant surfaces. His work also includes the studies of uh, the nature of leaf surfaces. The problems that his work seeks to address or the applications of this work are many. And just to name a couple, one of these is his work linking plant developmental abnormalities such as fruit residing with the associated uh, phytohormone producing bacteria on plants. And a second fascinating example of his pioneering work is on the biological control of fire blight, fire blight of uh, pear and apple using non-pathogenic bacteria. Steve is the recipient of numerous awards and was elected into the National Academy of Sciences in, in 1999, which is one of the highest honors that a scientist can receive. I've had the pleasure of hearing Steve speak several times over the years, and it's always been an, ex, an inspiring and mind expanding experience. So I'm really happy to have you here today, Steve, and thank you very much for taking the time. All right. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks for the nice words. Uh, yeah, we're going to touch briefly on a couple of things that Margaret brought up, but I'm going to put it in a broader perspective because today I want to kind of introduce you to plant microbiology per se, but I want to also kind of link it up to agroecology. And I know you've probably thought and heard a lot about cover crops and nurse crops and so on in terms of insects and so on, but what I'd like to really do today is kind of further develop that in terms of how your cropping systems and everything are really influencing the plant microbiology and how that's something that you should be kind of thinking about. But just a little bit of a background now. So we're gonna be talking about epiphytes, microorganisms that live on the surface of plants. In this picture, you see uh, uh, stomata for size comparison and lots of little bacterial cells all over the surface. But basically all healthy plants are covered with large numbers of various microbes, mostly bacteria, some fungi, uh, but there's millions of them on even the smallest little spot of a leaf. So the leaf, just think of it as completely surrounded by these microbes. And we'll briefly talk about some of the major roles that these microbes play, because they're very important, not only as pathogens, but really they have many beneficial effects. And I want to be kind of developing how our agronomic practices are kind of messing with the normal colonization of plants that probably are preventing some of the benefits from being achieved. But plants vary in how many of these microbes they have, and it's kind of driven by how much nutrients are leaked onto the surface of the plant. So the leaf is full of sugars and so on. If you see in the bottom, we've got sucrose and glucose and various sugars and organic acids, which are inside the plant, but they also leak out onto the surface of the plant where the microbes can, can eat them. And plants vary in how leaky they are and how much nutrients they provide. And some plants like tomatoes and beans and all have a lot more nutrients that leak to the surface than things like corn and peas, which have a real thick waxy surface. But it's kind of driven by how much there is there to eat on the leaf surface. And the more there is to eat, the more microbes you're going to tend to find there. But our study of microorganisms on leaves has really been driven a lot by pathogens because many plant pathogens live most of their life on a healthy plant and they build up inoculum on the healthy plant and under the right conditions of plant damage and the right kind of weather conditions, they can then invade and cause disease. And uh, we mentioned um, fire blight disease of pears and apples is a very classic example. A pathogen can live on the flower and if it gets to high enough populations in the flower, it can invade and cause disease. And so for many plant pathogens, we can actually predict disease by how much of the pathogen has developed as, a, as an epiphyte on the plant. If you get more and more bacteria growing on the plant surface, the probability of disease happening later is going to increase. And this has been very important in, in IPM type programs where we we only reading to enter a seed to reduce the populations when they're likely to cause disease. And certainly for fire blight and all that's become a really important management tool is to know when it's gonna be important to try to manage the population. Now, another organism we're gonna talk about today as well is uh, ice nucleating bacteria. These are bacteria that catalyze ice. 
we were all taught incorrectly that water freezes at 32 degrees zero Celsius. But that's not true. Water, ice will melt to form water at that temperature, but water will supercool and remain liquid to fairly cold temperatures. And various bacteria that live primarily on plants are nature's most efficient ice catalysts. <coughs> and um, so in the presence of these bacteria, water will only supercool to around minus two Celsius, around 28, 30 degrees Fahrenheit before it is triggered. And so frost damage to most of our important uh, crop plants, which cannot tolerate ice is dictated by how many bacteria that are present. In the absence of these bacteria, the plants can super cool. Plants are mostly water. And the water in the plants will not freeze unless there's enough bacterium on them to be capable of catalyzing ice at these warm temperatures. So they can cool to around 24 or 25 degrees Fahrenheit without the presence of the bacteria. The more bacteria that are present, the more, the warmer will be the temperature at which they freeze. And Normally there's fairly high numbers of these bacteria on the plants and that's why they freeze. So the potato plant you see on the left froze because there was a bacteria present. And a lot of our work, a lot I'm talking about is really trying to modulate how many of these microbes are on a plant. In this case, when they would normally be cold enough to freeze because as we dry the bacterial numbers down, they'll reduce the temperature at which the plants are gonna be freezing. And I'll show you some examples of how this is very practical. And I'll show you some work with citrus and others that we, we've done in the past. Because it's not just the cold temperature that kills plants. Plants can get quite cold without freezing. So this is a three-dimensional relationship from one of our plots. Damage to the plants, frost injuries in the vertical sense. As you get colder, and it get, you'll always see more and more freezing damage. But if you look at the numbers of ice nucleating bacteria, you see on this axis on the right. If you have high numbers of bacteria, you're gonna get a lot of frost damage even at a very warm temperature like minus two, which is around 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Whereas those plants that had relatively low bacterial numbers by various treatments that we applied, you see we didn't get the same amount of damage until it got four or five degrees Celsius Fahrenheit colder. So again, these bacteria are very important in terms of freezing. And the last introduction uh, Margaret mentioned is that bacteria also are very important in controlling how plants grow and develop. We used to think of plants under their own control, but in fact, the bacteria actually strongly impact them. And it's because of this molecule in the middle, 3 indole acetic acid. It's a major plant hormone that's involved in all aspects of how plants grow and develop. But bacteria, many bacteria that grow on plants also produce that hormone. And that's very important because they also then influence the plant indirectly by modulating the plant hormone level. And one of the things we've observed is this phenomenon of fruit resting on the left. When the fruit are very small, when they're less than about a centimeter in size, size of your pinky, high numbers of bacteria that produce the plant hormone change the normal development of the fruit so that when it starts to mature, the, the cells on the surface of the fruit are dead and we call it resident. But they're also beneficial because they also affect other plant traits like flower and fruit abscission, that's very important. And so they can actually benefit, you know, the retention of flowers and fruit that would impact yield and so on. So it's something that we hadn't really appreciated, but it's really very important about how many of these bacteria are present. Now, they're also one of the real obvious effects of these organisms on the plant, aside from the pathogens, which for the most part are bad, most microbes on leaves are very beneficial because they benefit, they reduce pathogen abundance. When you got a lot of non-pathogens on the plant, you can't have nearly as many pathogens also present. And this is basically the basis for a lot of biological control work that we and others are working on. And I'll just illustrate this phenomenon with fire blight because it's very, prominent to what we're gonna talk about here in just a second. Most plants as they first develop are not already colonized by bacteria or fungi. They enter life as a flower or a seedling coming up virtually sterile, but they get contaminated by various microorganisms by various ways. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Now in the case of pears and apples and other flowers, the, the 
female part of the plant is virtually sterile as it first emerges. And if it is inoculated by a pathogen like Winnie M. larva that causes fire blight disease as shown by the little red bacteria, those bacteria can grow with abandon and they grow to high numbers and, and disease is likely to happen. And that's why it's such a very successful pathogen. But what we have found is that if you can change that normal succession in the flowers so that if we were to inoculate with a non-pathogenic bacterium, it can grow and multiply just as quickly as a pathogen. And then if the insects were to bring that pathogen to the flower, it cannot multiply much because all the nutrients needed for growth are already used up by the non-pathogen, competitive exclusion of the pathogen. And this is the basis for a number of new strategies for disease control uh, where in this case, we're applying this competitive bacterium. You can buy it as blight ban A506, it's a strain we found and there's other bacteria and yeast that are also being sold for this purpose. Spray them on the flowers early so that they get colonized by a beneficial organism rather than the pathogen. And it's, it's become very prominent in terms of strategies for disease control. But this leads me back into the agroecology that I kind of wanted to talk about today, which is the question of where do these organisms come from? How does this colonization process normally happen? Because you can take a picture of, you know, look at this apple orchard here. Just try to convince you that those flowers are largely virgin. They're not colonized by microbes at this point when they're flowering. But they're typically grown in an orchard setting, in this case, where there's a lot of cover crop with this grass. It's been growing all winter here in California. It's got millions of bacteria on every little blade. And I'll show you in a little bit that the bacteria are very able to escape that leaf of the grass and move up into the flower. They move up into the air. Insects could probably also transmit them a bit, but we think of simple airborne transmission as particles. There's something about the bacteria, they basically jump off the grass and they move up into the air. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that. But what it seemed to suggest then is that the context in which these plants are growing is going to be very important in terms of what organisms actually end up in the, or in the flowers. If there was something else growing in between these trees, they might have a very different microbial community on those, on those plants. And I'm gonna swing around and I'm gonna come back to a picture like the upper left here in just a minute. But the real question is, if we now have an agricultural setting where there isn't really many other organisms around, and I'll show you in a second how bacteria that live in the soil, there are millions of microbes that live in the soil, and these seedlings, these little corn seedlings came up through the soil, but yet their leaves are almost totally devoid of microorganisms. Soil bacteria don't grow at all well, on the leaves. And so the real question is the context and the, this cornfield, where is the inoculum gonna come from to inoculate those, those uh, uh, leaves of the corn? We know that soil organisms do not grow well on the leaves of other plants. And so uh, they have to really come from other plants nearby. And so if you have a more diversified agricultural setting like this, then any plant coming up here is going to have lots of other green plants around that might be providing inoculum. So gonna, this is how I'm going to wrap up, but I want to kind of lead to how this is probably much more important than you, it's not just an esoteric question. Now I grew up on a farm in Oregon. My little brother is still a farmer. He raises a lot of uh, uh, grass seed. He raises uh, crimson clover seed. He raises a lot of wheat. And I was able to do experiments on this farm here a couple of years ago to kind of show this very strong context dependence in terms of what ends up growing on a given plant. And what I did is I took plants of uh, tall fescue, one of the crops he grew, I grew them up in the greenhouse, and then I transplanted a genetically identical fescue plant in the middle of his fields, the grass, clover, here you can see the little fescue in the middle of the clover and in the middle of the wheat. Then I came back here a month or so later to ask what was growing on the, on the fescue that I transplanted into these fields. If fescue was determining what grew on a fescue plant, then you'd think that they should all be the same no matter where they grew. But in fact, they are very, very different. And this plot up on the right, basically just the scatter plot and how far apart the colors are from one another shows how different the communities were. 
but basically the organisms on the fescue when it was growing in wheat were very different from where they were with clover and, and so on. So again, it's very dictated by who is near you, not necessarily who you are. You're not necessarily selecting for a particular community of microbes. You're able to support a variety of microbes that come from other plants nearby. And again, to reinforce this idea that plants emerge into the world naive and they're not colonized by microbes and they're kind of at the whim of their surroundings in terms of what ends up able to colonize them. And returning to these flowers, this is on pears. I had a picture of an apple for comparison though. These are the, the dark boxes on the bottom. This is the projected trajectory of colonization of the pear flowers in a, in a pear orchard up near Vacaville. And you see that when the flowers first emerged, there were very few bacteria on them and their numbers increased. And all of these graphs are a logarithmic scale. So there's like a hundred times more organisms on the flowers a week or two after they emerge and when they first come out. But what was really interesting is that we had inoculated some of the trees in that orchard with this Pseudomonas fluorescence strain, this biological control agent. And even though we only put a few microorganisms in each flower, they take off and they grow. And what you saw that, let's say a week after the flowers emerged, we had about 100 times more bacteria in the flowers that we had inoculated with an organism that grew very well in flowers compared to your average flower in the orchard, which were not inoculated. And this we take as an evidence of what we call um, immigration limited inoculation. So there wasn't an organism that were capable of growing in a flower that ever made its way to the flower. The flowers are sitting out there saying, colonize me, colonize me, but they couldn't because there wasn't the organisms there to do that. This orchard had a clean orchard floor and all, there wasn't a lot of organisms around. So the inoculum that you apply early in the development of the, organ, of the plant seems to be very important because all plants, flowers, plants that I studied in graduate school, they all have very, very, very low populations when they're early in the development and they only develop the populations that grow on the plants with some time. Now we think that this is dictated largely by the airborne transmission of microorganisms from one plant nearby to another. You could see insects fly from one plant to another, but airborne transmission seems to be enough to explain this. And to show this, we did a simple experiment. I work in Berkeley. Berkeley's on the east side of the uh, San Francisco Bay. The wind blows from the west. So the wind is blown off the ocean. They haven't seen plants in a long time. So we went down to the edge of the bay and we collected air just before it entered the land. And then we measured air, collected air about 100 feet or so into some grasses and other things that were growing along the the edge of the bay. So we had what we'll call impoverished air that had never seen plants and then air that had just passed over only like 100 feet of plant material. We collected the bacteria. And we did determine not only how many bacteria were present in the air, but also what kinds of bacteria were in the air. On the left, you see then how many bacteria we saw in what we'll call the upwind air before it saw plants and then the downwind air in the brown air we saw about eight times more bacteria in the air, even though it passed over only 100 feet of vegetation. So the bacteria were really moving off those plants and into the air. The air above the plants were very, very different from that before it had seen the plants. And then if you looked at the different kinds of bacteria that we can do by DNA analysis, you saw the composition from the different colors on the upwind air looked very different from the downwind air. And more importantly, if you looked at the different species of bacteria and just pick out Pantoia, very common bacteria on plants here. So those are the microbes that were on the plants over which the air passed. And here is the composition in the air over which it had uh, passed. So basically the air is looking a lot like the microorganisms of the plants over which it passed. I found it striking. So I have this image and you should, I think too, when you look out over, you know, patch of, of grass or anything, 
there's an invisible plume of microorganisms that have all entered the air above those plants. And we've more recently done some work help with uh, Rachel's help and all, where we did this in the valley as well. We simultaneously measured air in and near different kind of crops. And we found that sure enough, the microbes up near and above alfalfa would be different from walnuts and so on. So there's kind of a mosaic of microorganisms in the air. You can't see them, they're too small and too dilute, but they're all being driven by the local vegetation as the air is passing over this landscape of plants. Now this we can show to have very large, at least local effects. And that's one of the three examples of some of our uh, more practical work then. Let's visit this uh, phenomenon of fruit rustling that I mentioned before, where the numbers of microorganisms that are found on the fruit when they're young will uh, influence how likely it is to produce this russet phenomenon you see over here. By looking at the microorganisms of pears over a number of years, where there was a lot of different weather and we were in different grower fields where there were different amounts of vegetation, different kind of cover crops and so on, we saw there was a wide variation in how much russet we would see from year to year and from orchard to orchard, even in the same year. But when we put it all together, you saw that when we related how many microorganisms are on the, on the bottom axis versus how much russet, there's a very strong correlation. The more microorganisms on those fruit and little flowers early on, the more likely it was you were going to have a lot of russet. So we set aside then uh, uh, some very elaborate trials to document that that was driven largely by how many organisms that were on those flowers and little fruit early. And in turn, that was driven by the local vegetation in that orchard. So the orchard's coming out with flowers in the spring. What were the other green things around that could have drawn this? So working with the Thomas Brothers uh, uh, up in Mendocino County and Glen McGordy, we did some elaborate trials where we took a huge pear orchard and we divided up into blocks of about three acres each and we established different cover crops in a random pattern throughout the orchard. And uh, you can see picture here then where we had some bird clover and we had some grasses and then we removed the vegetation with Roundup as some of the treatments. And we measured then the microorganisms in the air at different places throughout the uh, orchard. And we also then measured the microbiology of the trees as well. And you could see a very strong effect. And this is like in the first, oh, 10 days or so in the growth of the orchard. And this is days after first bloom. You see, there was about 10 times more microorganisms on the on the flowers and little fruit of the pears when they were grown above these grass blocks than above, say, Roundup, which had removed the vegetation, or above burr clover, a plant that we had found earlier to be very low in its ability to support microorganisms. That is very waxy leaf. The microorganisms don't get to be in higher number. So those microorganism numbers on the flowers and young fruit were much higher when there was a lot of sources of those organisms floating around. And we had taken carloads full of undergrads up to the orchard as well. And we would simultaneously uh, open up these little petri dishes that we had hung in the trees at this particular time for an hour. And so simultaneously, we measured essentially the, the microbial communities and air throughout the orchard. And you could see that, in fact, there was huge variation in how many organisms and what types were found in the orchard. And those up in the trees above, say, these grasses and all, there was a lot more organisms present in the air than there was above, say, for clover again. So again, with the wind was blowing and all, you would have thought that, in fact, it was all kind of mixed up. And you'd see a similar microflora in the air, but it's not. It's locally constrained. If those organisms are so strongly emitted above the plants where they are coming from that they enrich the air right where they're at. And again, in that orchard, we saw there was a lot more fruit russet in those areas where we had the grass compared to, say, the clover cover crop. That's one example. Another one we recently have been doing a lot of work again with Glenn, Glenn McGordy up in uh, Mendocino County, where we've been looking at uh, frost injury to grapes. Um, 
And again, with the same idea, in this case, ice nucleating bacteria that are found on these cover crops, which don't grow particularly well on the grapes, but can immigrate to the grapes. This is like the intersection between one of the blocks where we had removed the cover crop and left the cover crop present and looked at the microbiology of the grapes and basically what was the freezing temperature of those grapes. And again, it, it could be very dramatic. The, this is the, the freezing temperature. The bar is going down, so it get colder and colder before the, the leaves and, and fruit were likely to freeze. And these hot colors here in the early part of the spring show that compared to the, the part of the vineyard where we had left the cover crops, it could get around two degrees Celsius or almost four degrees Fahrenheit colder before it was likely to freeze. We didn't have any frost in this plot to demonstrate it, but our measurements of the freezing temperature in the lab showed that that change in microbiology made it much less freezable, if you would. And one more example then to kind of get at the scale over which this vegetation effect happens, Kind of the biogeography of these cropping systems. I want to show you a study that we did a while back on citrus. And uh, the navel orange in the valley uh, grow in different contexts. Uh, many of them grow in big blocks where there are citrus you know, miles around, but others are growing near the edge of the valley where there might be other crops like grasses and pasture and other thing nearby. We wanted to see then could plants in the vicinity of a, a field have an effect on, on, the, on the crop itself. So we did a similar thing that we, I just mentioned with the pear where we had identified some uh, cooperating growers where they had, in this case, an orange block next to some grass. And we're gonna then measure bacterial numbers. Every season, Petri dish is set out for the bacteria to deposit on. And we're gonna look at the microbial communities on the oranges as well. We also look then at different distances away from the edge of the grove. There here you can see looking down a grove with our deposition plates. We're also going to measure the bacterial numbers. And we're going to contrast that in a, in a grove where it had a, a source of grasses and other things nearby compared to a grove where citrus is typically grown with bare ground, where there isn't any really obvious source of microbes. Because the bacterial numbers on citrus are typically rather low. And uh, their numbers, we think, are being driven largely by immigration from these other nearby fields. And so by looking at a variety of different paired grows where somewhere they have uh, grasses nearby and others where they weren't, you see a very dramatic effect, very similar to what we saw for the uh, pears. So what we're showing here in the green line, this is the bacterial deposited per hour on one of these petri dishes. And on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, is the distance into the grove measured in trees. So if you measure the bacteria depositing out of the air near the edges of the grove, kind of right next to the grass, they're much higher than they are and as they go into the grove. And the numbers you see go down and down and down. And as you got into the interior of the grove, there was a small fraction of the number of bacteria in the air than there were on the edge of the grove. On those groves that we use as kind of a check where they, they were only surrounded by other citrus, you see there were relatively small numbers of microorganisms in the air in any of the groves, and it was pretty much independent of where you were in the grove. It was kind of impoverished for microbes in the, in the air. And that way also dictated how many organisms were on the citrus itself. And so here we see again the numbers of bacteria that we actually found on the citrus leaves. And this is a logarithmic scale. And we saw it drop from about a million, more than a million bacteria on an average citrus leaf growing on a tree on the edge of the grove to about 10% that when we were in 20 trees from the edge of the grove. And again, you have contrast that with the red where we had citrus trees grown in big blocks where there wasn't anything other than citrus in the area. A, they had a lot lower bacterial numbers way less than 10%, less as much as 1% as number of bacteria. And it was kind of independent of where in the growth you were. There was no edge effect, if you were. So this edge effect seems to be huge. And it seems to extend as much as, oh, maybe 100 yards or more into a field. But this citrus was being influenced by its neighbors for 
maybe as much as a hundred yards or so. Now, while we were doing the trial, we did have a lot of uh, frost. It got cold that winter, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, there was a very big effect of this edge effect on the vegetation near these grows on the amount of frost damage those growers suffered. If you look at the bottom right, we'll look at the actual fruit frost injury. This is a measure of how many of the fruit were actually damaged from the freezing. And again, we're looking at a distance from the edge of the grow. And those grows that were next to grasses and other crops, you see there was a lot more damage to those uh, uh, fruit on those trees and near the edge, near the source of the bacteria than more on the inside. Each one of these lines represent a given orchard from one of our cooperators. And you contrast that with these grows that were adjacent only to citrus, A, they typically had a lot less frost damage overall than any of the grows that were next to citrus, next to grass, sorry. But it was also very independent of where in the grove it was. There was no edge effect because there wasn't these bacteria around it again. So again, it, Trying to impress you, it doesn't, it isn't just an academic question. It, there, there seemed to be a very big effect of this and this agroecology with you know your planting patterns and who your neighbor is and what kind of cover crops you've got. Because while I didn't really talk about the other work that we do, which is kind of all the nitty-gritty that goes on after the bacteria get to the plant, but a lot of it that's very important is this whole immigration and immigration effects that. A crop nearby is providing immigrants to new, and you are also providing immigrants to it. There's a lot of sharing of these microbes from plant to plant. And that you have some control over and, and could be very important. So again, I kind of circle back and it makes me think a lot about how we do ag and especially things like row crops, you know, where we grow things in pure stands with no weeds. And if you had a, a crop Again, without any obvious neighbors that are going to provide these immigrants to the field, they're going to be under colonized for some time. Again, there is no source of microorganisms that are going to move over onto these plants. And if a pathogen were to come along, it's very likely that it would be much more capable of colonizing because we do get this com com competitive exclusion. The bacteria on the plants can be very beneficial at preventing pathogenic bacteria and fungi from growing. Now this could be a good opportunity for agricultural probiotics. And I know some of you have probably been reading a lot about a lot of the big egg companies and all, they, they're big into studies of how could we inoculate plants with um, uh, various microorganisms. Seed inoculants is a big thing for row crops. There was a mention earlier about, you know, teas and all that, you might be able to inoculate plants with various microorganisms. I think the way we're growing these especially row crops without much source of inoculum, there is a real huge opportunity for uh, changing the microbiology. We may need to change the microbiology because it isn't gonna normally develop in the absence of uh, some kind of intervention. And again, again, think about the kind of large row crop fields that we're looking at. You know, basically, where is the leaf inoculum going to come from? It doesn't come from the soil for the most part. And it seems to have to come from somewhere else. And if you're in a big field, you're a long ways from the edge. And so we're really kind of wondering how prominent is this impoverished nature of the colonization uh, occurring in a, in a row crop field? So this, this spring, we're hoping to work with uh, Margaret and, and Rachel and others to, uh, to do some studies to look at this question of, of this immigration process in terms of uh, having a row crop field that's going to come up without virtually any organisms already present on that, oops, present on that uh, crop. Are the inoculum might come from tree crops or alfalfa or some other crop nearby? going to be important contributors to the inoculum that might be found in the uh, row crop field. So what we're really hoping to do then is to look at the microbiology of some row crops and look at those near the edge of the field where there's going to be one of these sources of inoculum and we'll move further and further into the field to see to what extent is a typical row crop field, if you would, 
suffering from the lack of, of appropriate and accurate. So again, that's something that we're really hoping to do more of this year. I think our work with our, you know, these grapes and citrus and all give us a lot of support that this phenomenon might be even more pronounced in, in a field crop kind of situation. Well, anyway, let's stop with that. And uh, if there's any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer. <laughs>